How's it going? I hope everyone's doing it right this morning. Today we're going to go over the uh, review for the quiz, or for the test, sorry. I did manage to get some batteries for my graphing calculator, so I'll make sure I demonstrate how to use that uh, to find all the statistics that we need. Does anyone have any questions before we get started? Here's our uh, test one review. There we go. Now the the first four or five questions, I think it's four. Um, these are all uh, from chapter one. And as you can tell, most of these are just going to be multiple choice or matching, okay? Because in, in, in every case, there's just like one answer, basically. Although with the, the sampling methods, I will make them matching questions. Um, so you have four questions and one answer for each, basically. So. Anyway, um, for problem one... And this is uh, part A. In this problem, we're, we're trying to find whether uh, the statement is an example of descriptive or inferential statistics. Now, in this case, descriptive means that it describes something, uh, describes a sample specifically, and inferential means it takes the sample data and makes predictions about the population. So in A, of the 82 nurses who worked during Labor Day weekend, 32 worked at night and 50 worked during the day and afternoon shifts. Now, that is simply a report on what happened with a specific group of nurses or a specific hospital. Um, and so we're not trying to make any predictions about these nurses or about how many nurses were working during Labor Day weekend. This is merely a description of what happened. So this would be descriptive. And 
And so in part B, an economist estimates the average income of lawyers in Texas to be $198,000 or 198500 dollars um, but again because there's a key word here that we look kind of look for with inferential and that's either that it predicts or it estimates those always tell us that something is inferential and as you might expect if there's two of these things and there's two possible answers then probably one of each here that's that'd be a fair assessment but the important thing is to be able to tell them apart For problem two, okay. we're given a list of uh, four situations to describe a variable, and uh, we want to determine if it's either categorical or quantitative. And for quantitative variables, we want to further state whether they are continuous or discrete. Okay. So for A, water temperatures of six swimming pools on a given day. Now when we talk about temperatures, uh, the way that we determine if uh, a number is quantitative is that if it can be measured or counted. Okay. We know that zip codes are not quantitative variables. Those are uh, numbers that are actually categorical, to kind of describe, you know, in which part of this of the city do we live? Okay, and so when we talk about temperature, though, that is something that can be measured or or counted. Specifically, temperature is something that we measure, and it can have a wide array of values. It's never just a whole number of value. It could have fractionals there if we wanted to. So um, when we talk about water temperature this is a quantitative measurement but more specifically a um, continuous quantitative measurement. B is the lifetime of 12 flashlight batteries. So any, any, anything that we talk about in regards to time, time is always considered a quantitative uh, variable, okay? Because it measures the length of time over which, uh, you know, something is occurring or, you know, how long are these batteries lasting, etc. So, because we are measuring the amount of time and not counting the amount of time, again, this is going to be uh, continuous. So quantitative and continuous. The number of bicycles sold in one year by a large sporting goods store. Now, when we talk about the number of something, number of bicycles sold, uh, number of students in class on a given day, th these numbers are countable because we're just counting how many bicycles or how many people are present, you know, one, two, three, four, five, etc. We don't get any of the fractional values, we don't get any of the, the decimal values. So this would be quantitative, but it would be discrete now. It would be discrete because again we're just counting the number of things we're not trying to make any measurements or have any and we won't have any fractional values of the number of bicycles they'll sell a whole number of bicycles and then d the classification of students in college, which would be freshman, sophomore, junior, or senior. 
whenever we talk about uh, non-numeric labels such as that, then that's always going to be a categorical variable. Since it's categorical, we don't have to say discrete or continuous because there's no such thing as the discrete or continuous categorical variable. Discrete and continuous only applies to quantitative. Um, so we want to be sure we don't try to go any further with that than we do. So we'll continue with problem three. So we want to identify the following as either observational studies or experiments, designed experiments, and certainly that will be a multiple choice question. A, a newspaper sends a survey to its subscribers in order to collect demographic data. Now whenever we're, we're filling out a, a survey, we're just collecting data, we're not trying to influence the, the type of data we get in return, we're just trying to collect it. In this case, we would go ahead and say it is an observational study. Subjects are randomly assigned to four groups. Each group is placed on one of four special diets, a low-fat diet, a high-fish diet, a combination of low-fat and high-fish, and then a regular diet. After six months, the blood pressures of the groups are compared to see if the diet has any effect on blood pressure. Well, this is very clearly an experiment, a designed experiment, because we've broken up the subjects into groups We've given them different treatments in their groups, and we're trying to influence a particular outcome. We're trying to see, you know, the effects on these different diets on the patient's blood pressures. I guess it's a singular experiment, it's just one. Okay. Okay, problem four. We have four, uh, uh, we have uh, four, you know, sentences or paragraphs that describe uh, how a sample was created for a statistical study, and we want to identify the type of sampling method that was used to create those samples. So we have four statements here, A, B, C, D, and um, we also have four possible answers, random, strat uh, systematic, cluster, and stratified. And so this is basically a matching problem. So A, in a large school district, two te all teachers from two buildings are interviewed to determine whether they believe students have less homework to do now than in previous years. And so the key there is that we select all teachers from two buildings. Uh, because we're only choosing two buildings, but then we're getting information from every single member of those buildings, or every single uh, teacher in those buildings, that's by definition a cluster sample. A cluster sample randomly selects um, you know we break up the uh, data or break up the sample into subgroups we randomly select a couple of subgroups there and get information from every member of that subgroup. 
In this case, the, the building represents the subgroup. So B, faculty chosen to serve on a committee are selected by drawing names out of a hat. So basically, if we're just drawing names from a hat, there's no other process taking here. We're just randomly selecting individuals to serve on this committee. And that's the keyword there, because this is a random sample. C, mail carriers of a large city are divided into four groups according to gender and according to whether they walk or ride on their routes. Uh, there, then 10 are selected from each group and interviewed to determine whether they have been bitten by a dog in the past year. So we broke them up into groups and we selected 10 at random from each group. And then, and then from that, that uh, 10 selected from each group, we then formed that as a sample and then asked them our question. In this case, this is stratified. And one of the one of the things that you'll notice is that this is pretty close to cluster as well. But it's important that we notice the difference between the two. Uh, stratified, as we have here, takes all the it, it breaks the sample down into subgroups and gets a random selection from each subgroup. Okay, So we have four subgroups, we get 10 people from each subgroup. That's stratified. For cluster, cluster breaks up the individuals into subgroups, and then we only choose a few subgroups, but we get every member of those selected subgroups. And so it's important that we know the difference between the two, because that's the two that I frequently see being switched on this test as far as uh, you know which one's right and which one's wrong. And then D, every 100th hamburger package produced is checked to determine its fat content. Uh, again, every you know every time we go every n number, that's always going to be a systematic sampling method. Sometimes it adds in like we start at number whatever, like we start at number five and we choose every tenth one from there. Um, but the, the hallmark of a, a systematic um, sample is that it, it's based on selection of every n number, okay, which is what we have here. Okay, so after those first four problems, that covers chapter one, the remaining questions all deal with this one data set, and we'll use this data set for all the questions from chapter two and from chapter three. And it lists them out here. Let me go ahead and write them down. I'll put them at the bottom of this page so I can refer back to them as necessary. Now the data here is the is from a sample of 25 freshman community college students who work full or part time, and they were asked how many hours they worked last week. The following data were collected. So I'm gonna go ahead and just write down the data for now, and we'll work with it on each of the remaining problems.
Okay, so this is the data that we'll have to work with for the remainder, remaining questions on this test. So first thing it has us do, this is problem five, is we want to organize the data using a stem and leaf plot. Okay, so for a stem and leaf plot, we certainly have uh, a, a list of stems and then the leaves that follow. Now, because we're working with two digit numbers here, our stems will be the tens digit and then the leaves will be the ones digit. So we look at all the different tens digits that appear here. We have numbers that are in the 10s, the 20s, the 30s, the 40s, and the 50s. And we don't have any single digit numbers. So we'll have 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 as our stem. Stems. Now for 1, that means we want to go through and find all the numbers that start with a 1. Okay. So we have 12 and 12. 15 and 15. And 18 and 19. And I believe that's everything. So for our leaves, we would do 2, 2, 5, Five, eight, nine. So that represents twelve, twelve, fifteen, fifteen, eighteen, and nineteen. Okay. So again, with uh, with our data, we want to make sure that if, if a data value occurs twice, we list it twice as a leaf. And notice we're also putting them in order from low to high as we do that. All right, next we look at our 20s. So just 20 by itself, we have one, two, three zeros. We have 21, no 21s. There's a 22. Um, just one 22. So I'll put a 2 on there. 23. No. 24. We have a, we have a 24. 25. 25. 25. 25. That's four 25s. Five, we have 28. I believe that's the only one in the 20 still larger than 25. So 28 and 28. We'll put two eights down. Okay. We'll move on to the 30s. Now in the 30s we have one that worked 30 hours. Just one. Two that worked 32 hours. So zero, two, Two. Let's see. Those are all gone. Then we have a 35 and we have a 36, so 5 and 6. Okay. 35 and 36. Uh, let's see. We have 40 and 45. So 40 and 45. Finally, I think 52 is the only one left, so I'll put down a 2 right there. Okay. 
So that's your stem and leaf plot. And at this point, what I normally do is I double check and make sure I've written down an equal number of data values. We know we have 25 specifically because that's what's told to us in the problem. So if we count these up, one, two, three, four, five, six, and I put a, a number out to the side here. That's 11, that's five, that's two, and that's one. This should add up to 25. Six and 11 is 17, plus five is 22, 23, 24, 25. That kind of, that's a nice check to make sure we got our number written down. Um, and it doesn't hurt to look back at the list again and just double check everything's still there. One of the great things about the stem and leaf plot is that it puts everything in order for us. So if you plan on doing your test by hand, that can be very helpful. Again, I would recommend not doing it by hand. Um, I'd recommend using a calculator, you know, to do this. But uh, if you need to do it by hand, then uh, put them in order certainly will be helpful as far as finding like the five number summary. Um, this is also helpful having the stem and leaf plot here. It helps us figure out what the the mode is. That'll be one of our next questions. Um, well, not the next question, but eventually we'll get to it. Okay, now questions six and seven. We want to create a grouped frequency distribution for the data set using five classes and a class width of nine. Now, the good news here. is that I already have the classes created for us. It's really just a matter of filling in the details. So we have a class or frequency and a relative frequency. So we have 12 to 20, 21 to 29, no, that's not true, uh, it will be 28, sorry, 29 through 37, 38 to 46, and then, uh, let me double check. No, I messed it up somewhere. I'm sorry. It, it was 21 to 29. Ah. Let's go to the next page. I'm just going to look at what I had written down. So this is the table they have us, they want us to fill out. And basically problem six is this column and problem seven is this column. And however many you get, I'll grade accordingly for each column. Okay, so the first class is from 12 to 20. So we come back in here and look at how many are in, in the range 12 to 20. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. So that means everything from 12 to 20, including both of those numbers on the end. 
So starting at 12 and ending at 20. There's nine data values that we found. Next group is 21 through 29. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight of our values are in that range, 21 to 29. 30 through 38, it'll just be these five right here, one, two, three, four, five. Thirty-nine to forty-seven will be these two, and forty-eight to fifty-six would be the final fifty-two. That's our maximum value. Okay, and we know. Okay, nine and one is ten. Eight and two is ten. So twenty, and then five more is twenty-five, and that adds up to twenty-five. How do we calculate the relative frequency? I know I haven't asked you a lot of questions this lecture, but How are we going to find the relative frequency for the 12 to 20 class? Is frequency divided by n? Mm -hmm. And so that would be 9 over 25. Yeah, the frequency here over the total frequency. So 9 divided by 25, which comes out to be 0.36. Okay. 8 over 25 is 0 0.32 5 over 25 is 0 0.20 2 over 25 is 0 0.08 and 1 over 25 is 0 0.04 and that should add up to exactly 1 okay so it's nice to check those even if we aren't explicitly asked to check those it's always a a good thing to be conscientious about. So that's our distribution. And again, I'm going to give you the classes. You just have to fill in the frequency and the relative frequency like we did here. Now question eight, they want us to make a histogram for the frequencies. And again, this is hours worked by students. If we wanted to, we could be more, more specific and say the past week. Um, down here we have the um, number of hours. And over here we have our frequency. Notice it asks for a frequency distribution, so we'll use frequency. If it had has asked for a relative frequency histogram, we would use the relative frequency instead. Okay. Now, as far as how we mark this off, again, on the number of hours, since our first class is 12 through 20, we mark down 12, and then when the next class starts at 21, the next one starts at 30, 39, and then 48. And the last class goes from 48 
to 56. So we'll put 57, which would start the next class if we did have another class after that. Okay, because so we're going to have a bar graph and we know that the bars are going to be adjacent. But um, remember that we always use the lower um, limit of each class. So 12, 21, 30, 39, and 48. Sorry. So these numbers all over here are what we'll put on the scale. And then whatever number follows where this one ends, is be, that'll be where the next one starts if there were another class. We want to make sure to include that as well. All right, so one, two, three, four, five. I'm going to mark that off, six, seven, eight, nine, and then we have 10. So 12 to 20 has a frequency of nine. If you want to use a ruler to draw these, that's fine, or you can freehand it like I'm doing, that's also fine. You will need to scan and upload this uh, histogram. Probably we'll have to do the same for the stem and leaf. Maybe. Um, anyway, I may figure out how to do that in, in Canvas quiz without requiring an upload for the stem and leaf. Definitely for the histogram and then later for the box plot, you'll have to scan and upload or, or take a picture of these of your work here and upload this as the solution to that problem. Okay, next one starts at 21. 21 to 29 has a frequency of 8. So it's one step lower than the previous one. 30 to 38 has a frequency of 5. Thirty-nine to forty-seven has a frequency of two, and forty-eight to fifty-six has a frequency of one. And so that would be our histogram. It certainly, looks like they're in descending order already. Again, the main thing is, you know, we, we put a title, put mine up there, we title the histogram, we label each axis, you know, this one's always frequency or, or relative frequency, whichever one is asked, right, this is kind of describing what, uh, what we're measuring on that particular side of the graph, which is the number of hours worked. And And then from there we go ahead and uh, we just sketch in our bars. Okay. All right. Starting with the next question, this is where we're going to re require our calculator. Starting with question nine. This question nine asks for this five number summary right off. So this is a little bit out of order from how we learned them in chapter three, but regardless of which one we do first, we're gonna to have to put everything into our calculator before we do anything else. Now up to this point, I've demonstrated everything on my uh, smaller calculator. I thought I'd go ahead and, and show you on the larger calculator today, just to, uh, just to give some variety in the instruction on the uh, 83s and the 84s we would press stat and we want to edit so it's just the first option here we'll just press enter and here we get to our lists l1 l2 l3 it actually keeps going to l4 l5 and l6 so here we're going to enter all 25 of our data values so I'm just going to do that now. I'm going to do them three at a time, so just by column. So we have 15, 25, 32, 
20, 40, 12. 12, 36, and 22. 45, 28, and 28. 52, 25, and 32. 30, 20, and 35. 25, 15, and 24. 20, 18, and uh, 25. And then 19 should be our 25th one. Let's see, 25 in parentheses there. Arrowing back up. Again, making sure I didn't uh, misclick or mishit any numbers. Uh, and it won't always be obvious if we make a mistake there. Um, I'm just looking to see if I you know, only entered a single digit when there should be two, or if I double hit a number and there's, there's three digits where there should be two. Um, we, we can, you know, if we feel a little more paranoid, you can go through and then double check that you entered each number exactly as it was in the list. It takes a little bit longer, but at least we're certain. I, I, I generally feel pretty confident, but I don't, I can't guarantee that it's a hundred percent accurate. So it, it is worth looking at again. All right, so we've got all our data in there. So we go to stat. Now on the graphing calculators, we arrow over to calculations, calc, and then you see here one var stats. That's the same thing that we've been using on the smaller calculator. We select that. On the 83, this is where it's, it's different. Uh, the 36 that I have been using to demonstrate, we just, you know, we pick which list that all our data is in L1, L2, and L3, and then we just go from there. On the 84s, it's actually the same way. You just pick which one is our, our data and go from there. The 83s, though, we actually have to do a little bit more by hand. Uh, so if you'll notice, right here above the one button, see it says L1 right there. Okay, then L2, L3, L4, L5, and L6. So depending on which column we entered our data in, we would press second and L1. And so that'll give our uh, statistics for the data that's stored in L1. So if we have an 83 specifically, it's a little bit different than the other two. And that's part of why I wanted to show you. After that, we just hit enter, and now it brings up all of our statistics. These are the same statistics we saw on the other calculator, although they're in a slightly different order, but well, that, that's okay. And then finally, we arrow all the way down, and we get our five number summary, minimum, Q1, the median, Q3, and the maximum. So for nine, the minimum, get the calculator out. minimum is 12. Q1 is 19.5. The median is 25. Q3 is 32. And the maximum is 52. Now, one thing that the calculator does not tell us is the mode of the data. Generally, we can tell what the mode is by looking at the stem and leaf chart. So by looking at this, which of these numbers occurs most frequently on our list here?
25, right. So in question 10, when they want us to identify the measures of central tendency, we have the mean, the mode, the median, and we also have mid-range. Now, the mean is listed here. Remember, the, the x with the bar over it is the mean, so that's 26.2. We said the mode was 25. Now, the median, I already wrote that one down once, so hopefully that'll just be free points. Uh, median is 25, so we'll write that down again. And then the mid-range, remember on our formula sheet, we had a formula for the mid-range, which was the min plus max divided by 2. So we'll take the minimum 12 plus the maximum 52, and then divide those by 2. And so that's 64 divided by 2. Uh, that gives us 32 as our mid-range. Okay. Alright. Now number 11 with the measures of variation, which are range, standard deviation, and interquartile range, which I'll just abbreviate to IQR. Okay. Now the range, once again, the range, we saw the formula on our formula sheet, that's maximum minus minimum. In this case, to take 52 minus the 12, and that's why we have a range of 40 values. Now, standard deviation, this is a number that's given on our calculator, this is SX, so here we get 9.97, uh, or we could round that to 10.0, 10 that would be uh, one, one place out there, the decimal, if we said 10.0. Um, and then the interquartile range, remember, is Q3 minus Q1. In this case, this Q3 is 32, and Q1 is 19.5. And so that gets us a value of 12.5. So again, for a standard deviation, remember we're going to use SX from the calculator, as opposed to Sigma X, which will be slightly different. Range is max minus min, and the interquartile range is Q3 minus Q1. <coughs> Alright, next we need the values of the fences, and we want to determine if there are any outliers.
Now for our fences, remember we had formulas, again given on our formula sheet, our lower fence is Q1 minus 1.5 times the IQR, which in this case is 19.5 minus 1.5 times 12.5. lower fence our lower fence will be 0.75 Upper fence is Q3 plus 1.5 times the IQR. Q3 is 32 plus 1.5 times 12.5. So that would be 32 plus parentheses 1.5 times 12.5, close parentheses. And so that gives us a value of 50.75. So the question now is, are there any outliers? Well, by definition, any outlier is any number smaller than 0.75 or any number larger than 50.75. So going back into our stem and leaf, we don't have anything smaller than, than 0.75. Our, our smallest is actually 12. Okay. And do we have anything larger than 50.75? Well, 52 is bigger than 50.75, so 52 would be considered an outlier. done with this test or the review. The test will be just like this review as far as the questions that are being asked. So we'll continue to 13 where they want us to make a box and whisker plot. numbers our data is going to range from 12 through 52 so I want to make sure I construct a number line with those on there so I'll start at 10 okay and I made marks by the fives So our five number summary, again, we, we had this on a previous page. Minimum is 12, Q1 19.5, median 25, Q3 32, and the maximum is 52. Let's see, so we have minimum of 12, 
Again, rather than put it on the line, I'm going to put it a little bit above the line just so I can actually show a good visual of the box without the number line kind of uh, overlapping it. Uh, Q1 is 19.5. So kind of eyeball where that is going to be. Median is 25. Q3 is 32. And maximum is 52. Now we want a line connecting each of these points. And then the middle three points, we draw vertical lines and close them up for our box. So that's our basic box plot. Again, we wanted to go a little bit further and, and plot in the fences and the outliers. So one fence was negative, or sorry, it was positive, but 0 0.75. And the other was 50.25, which is actually inside of our data. So we did have one outlier here at 52. I believe that was number 13. There's a box plot. Looking at that, it does appear to be slightly skewed to the right, but rather than using the box plot to determine if it's skewed or symmetric and then if it's uh, spread out or compact, I would prefer for us to use the, uh, the guides that I gave you on our formula sheets. Uh, which was <clears throat> to compare the median and the mean and then uh, for the skewed or, or symmetric and then to compare the range divided by 4 to the standard deviation to use the range rule. And that's our last two questions here. Um, so again, question 14. Is the data skewed or symmetric? And we want to explain and support our answer. Now for this, we're going to compare our median and our mean. Now, in this previous page, we found our median was 25 and our mean was 26.2. So the comparison is that the median is actually less than the mean. And on our formula sheet, that tells us that the data is skewed to the right. Now, that's all we really need to, to write down, is we want our answer included, whether it's symmetric or skewed left or skewed right, and our justification for that, which in this case is our comparison between the median and the mean. And that's the one I would like for you to use, the median compared to the mean. Um, you could do it based on the histogram or the box plot, but preferably using actual statistics, it's going to be better than making a judgment call from a graph. Um, but uh, nevertheless, the skewed right, the fact that it's skewed right, is actually displayed by both the histogram and the box plot. So that's, it's at least as consistent, I guess. Okay, and then 15, this is the last question. We want to determine if the data is spread out or compact. And again, we can use, use the range rule to figure this out. Let's compare the range to the standard deviation. 
our range, and this is actually on the back of this page I'm writing on. The range was 40. And the standard deviation was approximately 10. Okay. Now our comparison for this is the range divided by 4, which is 10, and S, which is 10. Okay. Because both of these are 10, they're equal to each other. So we have R over 4 equals to S. So what that tells us is that uh, the data is symmetric and bell-shaped. Well, not symmetric, norm, normal and, and bell-shaped. Since R over 4 equals S. Okay. Again, on a range rule, you know, if R over 4 is less than S, then that means it's spread out. If R over 4 is greater than S, that means it's compact. But on the on the rare chance that they're equal or very close together, we could say that the data is a normal bell-shaped distribution. Okay. Again, what I'm referring to for this formula sheet is right here. Let me zoom a little bit there. Um, So it has our different formulas for uh, any of the different things. We didn't, we never did talk about mid-quartile, but it's no big deal. Um, but like, if we want the shape of the distribution, comparing median to mean, that's what we'd use for number fourteen. Okay. And then we have our range rule, which we can use for number fifteen right here. But then it has all the other formulas for the stuff that we talked about in this chapter. So this is our formula sheet for chapter three. I'll make sure I include that as part of the uh, the test, so that you'll have that available as you take the test. Okay. Are there any questions? Well, that wraps up the review. Um, probably later today, it may not be until this evening, because it depends on how much I'm actually able to do during my office hours today, which are from 1 to 2.30 and then from 5.30 to 7. So either during the afternoon or the evening office hours, I plan to get the test up and uh, ready to go. Uh, for y'all to take so starting from let's say this evening until any time before uh, so by next Tuesday's class basically um, so that you know I'll probably have a do like Monday evening or maybe even Tuesday uh, evening uh, that way I can assign it to both of my classes because the, the Monday Wednesday class will have their test due Wednesday next week. So I'll probably try to accommodate both classes with that due date and just assign it to everyone. Um, anyway, so you'll, you'll see that when it pops up as an assignment, what the due date will be. So just make sure you pay attention to that. Even though you have this, you know, almost a week to work this thing, again, you only get one attempt at it and you'll have two hours to complete. Uh, and, and it does require a couple of file uploads and uh, a lot of it otherwise is multiple choice or fill in the blank. Um, so make sure you plan accordingly that you have enough time to complete it uh, that you don't get locked out of it before you're done. Um, and let me know if you, if you do have any questions. Um, and, and I can answer them in between. All right. 
So I think we'll leave it at that for today. You all have a good rest of the day. And uh, on on Thursday, we're not going to have any class. Uh, I'll just allot you that time to uh, so there won't be a lecture that you need to show up for on Thursday. I'll just uh, let, you, let you have that time to take the test if you want it or if you prefer to take the test over the weekend or whatever, that's fine too. But uh, I'll at least allow that class or that normal time that we would use for lecture on Thursday for you to work on your test instead if you want to do that. So, um, so no lecture Thursday. We will meet again for lecture on Tuesday next week. And hopefully by then everyone's done um, with the test. I think that'll be best. And then we'll start. <laughs> well, I didn't mean to rhyme that. Uh, we'll start. Uh, probably I'll go ahead and give you the first part of your project on Tuesday next week. So um, anyway, so y'all take care and uh, let me know if you have any questions. Good luck with the test.